going to read line for line because it's so impressive. I don't want to miss anything, but I want to speak before I go down that list of just my experience of conversating and having the opportunity to work with Alex. Sometimes when you work with a top performing CEO, you never know where you're going to get. I've seen the good, I've seen the bad, I've seen the ugly. When someone talks about operational excellence and you see that extracted in their company, you never know what type of personality, especially at that level, you're going to get. Alex has a true open heart. He's been so humble and so willing to teach. And Angel and I were talking about this last night. Alex, you don't know this. We were blown away because when we were all sharing our superpowers, Alex told me last night at dinner, I was writing down, oh, her superpower and this superpower and that superpower, right? How is it? Probably the biggest company in this room who's been in the industry this long. He was the one taking notes about everyone's superpower. That's not ironic, right? That's what separates the top of the top. I probably overdid it with Alex already, but I do want to read a few credentials that I think are just too important. 20 plus years in the industry, started as a janitor himself from three employees, now to 1,300. Can we get two clap for that? 1,300 employees, yeah. More than two uh, Yeah, more than two claps. Awarded three years in a row, the fastest top 100 growing companies in the nation, Award, awarded also most admired CEO in Houston Business Journal, participated in multiple acquisitions on both sides, served as a board member, advisor, and consultant, and highly involved in community engagement, and really big in philanthropy, and uh, giving back uh, to the community. So without any further ado, please welcome up Alex Melgar. I'm actually going to take the mic from it first. We're going to we're going to play some uh, hot potato here. So I want to use this time. I'm going to kick us off with uh, a few questions. And I also forgot to say, former CEO of Ambassador Services and founder of Usource. Um, my very first question for Alex, and if anyone has a question, we're going to hand you the mic. You'll stand up, ask the question. We're going to engage like that. Is Alex, if you would just be so kind to maybe take us through a few key principles that you developed with an ambassador early on, and now in the, uh, that's translated into you source, um, that's seen the success and growth of your company. To have 1,300 people now, to go from three to 1,300, what were some of those key principles um, that you had to implement into both companies? And uh, we just want to share some thoughts on that. Sure. First of all, um, this is an amazing event. I'll tell you, I mean, we, he did deserve an applause, for sure. We did that. When I got invited to this, uh, to the event, and talking with um, James and, and Angel here, um, I was impressed by their vision of trying to put together something that support the janitorial industry. Because as you know, there's no many of this. Not something to this level where it's so personal that you connect with the others. Uh, there's big events happening in Vegas, you name it. And someone told me yesterday, I believe, the field lost being on one of those big events. We're not here, we connected and it's very impressive. I have big takes away, okay. big ones, and I'm sure everyone here will have something to take back home. Okay. Now, so as far as those principles, I think consistency is top one. Um, trust your team. Self-development. You've got to continue developing yourself because you are the leader. The bigger you get, the smarter the people around you it gets, you have to lead them. And you've got to be compassionate about you know, the people who work with you and provide the tools for them to succeed. You can't just ask them to step in a position of self-position, operational position, and pretend that they will come and just know everything about your business. Then you will learn, you will judge them for not being able to pick up your 20 years of experience in one week. 
So I think those would be the five top uh, principles. All right, I said I had one question. I actually have two questions, and this came from a, a conversation we were having last night. I think a lot of you guys will be interested in this because I've heard this within conversations we've had already this week about people bumping their head at a certain revenue level. Last night you said a CEO with a million dollars revenue shares the same title as a CEO with a billion dollars uh, revenue, right? But there's a big gap there. And you talked about your growth from zero to one mil, one to five, five to 10, you talked about the tipping point at 10, and then 10 to 20, and then 20 and beyond. Can you maybe just shed some light on that? Because I know I've had at least three conversations with people saying, I'm bumping my head at $1.5 million in revenue, I'm bumping my head at $3 million in revenue, and I'm like, I just wait to talk to Alex, because that's exactly what you and I were talking about last night. Oh yeah, last night. <laughs> um, one thing I learned and by the way, there's one more principle I forgot. You gotta be humble. And this will lead, humble that you don't know everything. This will answer that question. As we were growing, I started realizing that first I need to continue educating myself. And that's what I, last night I, I shared with you something, a term that I learned we call ROADS. The rate of self development. So how quickly are you developing yourself to be the ones that work with you? You need to be humble to surround yourself with individuals that can already walk those roads. I start surrounding myself with advisors, consulting, individuals just like Mark, uh, Jessica, you know, Joe, uh, you say, what was that? I can't pronounce his name. Eagle. Eagle, yeah, Eagle. Um, amazing individuals that you have a lot to learn. So I think not only you need to develop yourself, you know, before your team, being humble to learn from them, being humble to look for help. Every stage in the business, we've been there. Um, Say so we still have a lot to learn of where we're going. Uh, I do remember when my focus as a CEO was knowing the names of all my employees so I could call them. That changed later. Then I started focusing more into the sales. Oh, I'm gonna be the guy selling because I already have a good operator. And then shift. And I say, well, I have to focus on profitability. And later, no, employee retention. And what you might think, all of these things are important at every stage in life of the business. The point I'm trying to make is you as a leader will have to evolve with your business. The CEO of a million dollars company holds the same title that the one for a billion dollars. The difference between those two individuals in same responsibilities, the difference is how they execute that responsibility of pushing forward that company. That is what it took to me a couple of years ago to understand that I've been involved. I uh, hear, like yesterday I was taking notes about superpowers and challenges and maybe I already walked, I mean I've been you know, on those roads. I, one of the things I noticed it was like, a lot of it wants to focus on sales, I'm not closing the deals, or hey, I do have problems operational wise, and I'm telling myself now with my experiences, I don't, I think we are not talking about what really is the end goal of we being in business. And we talk today, I mean I hear, is sometimes I, what I learned is we're not managing services. you managing money. The individuals that work for you become the product that bring that money to you. So you protect the product, you protect the machine, sharp those individuals, but don't take your focus away from really what the end goal is. Bringing sales, I mean, it might look difficult, but once you have the sales, then you have another problem, and that's delivery, the product. We have worked with many subcontractors, many, many, 
hundreds, thousands. And a lot of times we have beat them with contract because that's what they ask for. Not knowing the two things will happen. One, they want to run out of money, cash flow, never consider. And that have to do with the, what I was telling you, finance, the, the growth, not necessarily the, the revenue, doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be more profitable. That was taught today. I'm very interesting. That was, I was listening. So, yeah, pretty much. This is only the, that's what the conversation we were having last night. Yep, absolutely. <laughs> any uh, anyone want to use this opportunity to ask any questions to Alex about his experience? Um, any type of knowledge that you can extract from someone that's really scaled from where they were at three employees at one time to 1,300. Um, now is the opportunity, and no question's a bad question. By the way, that's the humility he brings. Open the gates, open the gates. <laughs> Hello. Um, do you hire employees or do you subcontract currently? We, can, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Um, no, I'm not <laughs> We use both. We use both uh, currently. Um, I think the last time we checked, we were at 87% direct labor or employees level two and another 13% was subcontracting services. Uh, we've been on both sides of the equation. Uh, the company at one point was 80 plus percent subcontracting, and then we went to the W2 model. Okay. Um, how do you handle a subcontractor or an employee that is struggling and you wanna help build them up and help them perform better? What's your best advice for building somebody up who needs management skills or um, just more resources to help deliver a better product in the end. Is the question aligned to the subcontractor yes. or the employee? We mostly subcontract, so say we have a subcontractor who can't seem to deliver, keeps making mistakes and we're frustrated with them, but we don't exactly know how to support them in the best way possible to help them deliver for us and for them. Um, one thing to consider is uh, your interview process, right? Um, subcontractors, in a way, need to be interviewed just the way you interview an employee, right? Um, I, I'm a big believer that your subcontractor is there to solve your problems, not to create problems for you, right? Think of uh, me being your customer, and if I have to train you to do cleaning, then you're not doing your job, or I'm not doing my by hiring a person, the right person. Um, I will probably suggest that in that interview process, you identify whether they have the capability to do or perform the services that you're looking them to perform. If they ever have any experiences cleaning that type of facility, uh, if they have the financial strengths to actually support that facility or services that you are asking them. If you have a question, can you raise your hand so I can leave them, leave them raised, please, so that I can, so I can take the mic? And I will, there's no way, there's no way, unless you have 1,300 employees, that there's no questions. So let's make sure we get them. So we got one, two, three, cool. Thank you, just a follow up uh, with regard to the last question. Is you said you had a model of uh, 1099 employees and you, you converted to W2 employees. My question is why and how? Yeah. Um, it boils down to what is the vision and today a lot of what, what I'm going to answer to you we actually saw that today through the presentations it boils down to what is the mission of the company um, is your vision to pass through to someone I uh, hear someone here saying oh, I was just going to pass it to my kids another do you want to exit what you sell it, right that will answer the question because subcontracting service, as you grow up an organization, in my experience, you will eventually lose control. Your multiplier will be lower and your market to be acquired will be narrow. Um, there's a few big players that are actually interested in buying companies that subcontract out work. In our case, that was not our buyer. 
<coughs> uh, one of the things I, uh, I was talking earlier with a couple uh, you know, the attendees here is, who is your perfect buyer? Who's your perfect I mean, individual to buy your services and who's your perfect buyer to acquire you and what is your, your family? What do you want to leave behind, right? You want to leave behind uh, subcontractors, you want to leave, you know, something that they eventually can sell because how far you want to go, right? You might think, I'm just going to pass it through, that's why subcontracting services is perfect. But do the individuals you're going to pass it through are, are going to be selling the business or they're going to be passing it to someone else? That, so that, that kind of will give you that guide on why you're going to do certain things. There's no good or bad model for us is we are looking for the next strategy to be acquired by a bigger company. And my buyers are not interested in buying 1099 uh, company with that label. Just a quick follow-up, thanks everyone. Um, what is the threshold? Um, what was the number of annual revenue where you decided, listen, we gotta go to a different model? And that's a my final question, thanks. Um, I, I think we made that decision when we were just about $7 million in revenue. Um, but it have, there's no, again, there's no perfect numbers. Mm -hmm. I've been involved in companies that they make the switch when they're already at a $20 million. It's just, again, there's some companies being, a, you know, they're second generations and they're being operating like this. And then there's that moment where they're like, mm -mm, we want to pursue different type of contracts. For instance, if you're gonna pursue uh, government, for instance, they're not going to allow you to subcontract out the entire country, right? So then there's that pivot point where you're like, okay, do I really want to continue doing this or I want to go the other way? So access to bigger potential clients is really the, the answer. Right. From Potentially. What I, yeah. Thank Potentially. you. Thank you. Can, can you guys hear, by the way, back there? You guys can hear? Yeah. Okay, cool. I know we have Andrew with the question and I think somebody over here. Um, my question is, when you were growing your business, um, how did you think about organic, organic growth versus acquisition? And I'm sure that's evolved over time, but when you were doing it, would you have done it sooner or would you have waited on that to do an acquisition? Oh. We, we've gone through three acquisitions uh, so far within the organization. I've been on the other side, uh, you know, where I support selling, uh, you know, divisions. If you are in need of growing certain areas of your business and you want to skip the, you know, the groundbreaking work, I would suggest, for instance, I'll give an example. Or operating costs for specialty services, what I mean, window, floor care, and all that, was very high. So we decided to look out for a company that will specifically focus on floor care. So we acquired the company, and that gives us a more infrastructure, a, a customer base on the floor services that we can sell our janitorial services later. So uh, the strategy is very important. Like yesterday when we were talking, I said well, superpower is a strategy. I think that everything starts, a good strategy will support a failure of implementation strongly, but a weak strategy will not support failure of the implementation. So it, it, everything starts on what really is the goal and what are you trying. You don't just, in my opinion, you don't just acquire revenues. There's many things that it can go right or wrong. I mean, we, we've seen it. Uh, a lot of individuals don't talk about culture integration. I'll tell you one thing, we focus heavily, heavily, and spend a lot of money on it as in company culture. I, we went through two, we sold two companies before. I've been through selling two janitorial companies. And the second company that we sold, the, the, the culture that was created was not what I wanted. It's not scalable. So we sold it to someone who which culture will work and fit. So now we focus on that culture. Every acquisition that we make must to fit that culture. Or it will disrupt your business in the way they actually came 
destroy your business. So you sold the first company because of the culture that was being built, right? Or one of the reasons. So when you started that next company, was that sort of uh, uh, front of mind at that stage? Or at what point did you have the aha, like, oh, yeah, it's the culture. Does that make sense? Yeah. It, the company was not for sale, but we always keep the company selling. It's always in our, we always keep it like when someone can acquire. When we started this ambassador services, from the beginning, we decided we're just gonna be a different type of company. One of the things I wanted to take away was that stigma that we janitors, because I continue being a janitor, it's just a high paying, paying janitor with more experience, is that we are gonna show up in the building carrying a bunch of keys with a mop in our hands. I told myself, I told my partners, I told my personal individual, you, we are not selling janitorial services. Do not call my company cleaning company. We are professional maintenance services. And with that in mind, if you ever visit our company uh, or offices, we Angel have that opportunity. We also push the culture that everyone is a CEO. Prior, individuals were coming to me for questioning. Oh, like, hey, how do you do that? Why should I answer this? What? We decided, you know, we're gonna decentralize information and let them make decisions. That was in this company. So, when someone <coughs> joins us, we don't try to push all this knowledge now in one month. We simply tell them, look, focus on one area, and we were talking about how do we onboard now super, super, supervisors. The first thing we do, we just send them into the building after watching all these videos, training manuals, obviously we got more sophisticated in the training process, but go to the building and the only thing I want you to do is to check on dust. Just go to check dust. Just if there's built any dust in this building. I'll give you 10 buildings, come back, Give me your findings. We're trying to kick that um, mindset that they are in charge and that they have the voice to critique everything else that we are doing. And so there, there's, uh, again, there's different things that needs to be implemented, but uh, yeah, culture, number one priority for us now. Did I answer your question? It, it did, thank, thank you. Raise your hands if you have a question, please, so that I can get you afterwards. Hi. Um, what does your onboarding training process look like, especially with a company of your size, that kind of the, for our company, we look at like day one to day 90. For you, what does that look like? Oh, I wish I would have the experience that I have now and I had to have to go through those, you know, pain points. Um, there's different positions, so we decide that, you know, we break it down in different types. Technicians, managers, and directors, so executives. The managers, there's leads, supervisors, and managers in the same training. And I got, one time someone asked me, but I'm, I'm not a manager, why would you train me? Same as the manager said, because you're my next manager. That's what we train them to be a manager. My executives, they're everyone in the office, everyone that is admin, have to go through the same training that any executive will go through the company. Learning why you are in business, why you do things the way you do, history. You, you are important because they see you as a leader. We were talking about leadership. If they sense that you are not leading them, they will leave you. Um, yesterday I hear a few of you guys talking about, you know, talent acquisition. Today, as you know, we were talking, they were talking about leadership is, why would they leave you? Why are you not attracting those talents? And a lot of the times have to do with, and you know, how are you projecting your vision, mission of the company, and that sounds very easy to say. 
because we already have that in place. But it starts a very, you can start very easily with just saying, you know, why we are in business. Oh, because we want to become the biggest janitorial service provider, the biggest, you know, maintenance company in the city. But why are your values, right? Respect, you know, support, understand, whatever those are, make sure the individuals that you're hiring understand and align with that vision. 30 days, first week, learning all about the company, the vision, the mission, and we test it. I personally test it. If I'm walking around my office and I, everyone get introduced and there's a massive email that goes you know, to everyone. Uh, when we hire, I would say, the supervisors and above, obviously we cannot do it. I mean, at least not that I, I, I will see them. But we send a letter, send a card. Every time we hire a technician and I personally sign it. Say welcome to the team, here's our core values, here's your uniform, this is what we believe in. Second week is all about the technical aspect of their job. Right? Learning where's the area for work, you know, what tools do they have available for them. And then you go forward, you know, with other things like how to reach out to HR, you know, with issues. So we just break it down in stages. But you can start with something very, uh, you know, basic. Yeah, we're having just trouble with, you know, frontline specifically. We have about 220 employees. Getting them to one, having a consistent onboarding program, and then what does that like on-site training look like? Mm -hmm. And getting them, like you said, buy into what our vision, our mission is. But also at the end of the day, they're in a building to clean toilets and clean an office building or whatever it is, and trying to make that as exciting as it can be, uh -huh. but making sure that they feel part of the team special because they don't come into an office every day. They don't see, you know, they don't see their supervisor every single day. So to make them feel special because they don't have uh -huh. someone they see every day. So that comes from the top, comes from you. Train the trainer. So you start with the one that reports to you, the first one and make sure that that individual aligned with that vision and he passed it down to the next one. I mean, you, you have no idea how many times I corrected my team. You know, I, even in things like, you know, oh, we are the best janitorial company. Wait a second, no. Oh, my janitors, you don't have janitors. In my company, there's no janitors, by the way. There's technicians. Because my job is to elevate the way they see themselves so they can elevate the company. I want them to know that they're important. Even if you supervisor don't do it, something so simple, like every month, all the individuals that you hire, whether they left or just joined the team, have a letter with a wet signature on it. Preprint, they say thank you for the time you work at my organization. I'm sorry it didn't work out. You know, if you ever have any need, would like to come back, come and apply. Same situation, welcome to the team. So there's little things that you can do that make that huge impact, not only in your retention, you can say, you know, your, your consistency in services and the growth of your company. Can I answer your question? Yes. Raise your hands, for the question? Question? Don't be shy. Thank you, there we go. Thank you. We'll walk over there real quick. And you guys can hear me well there, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Hey, good afternoon. Um, so um, earlier he was talking about kind of like the the levels of revenue, um, and I know like a lot of people in this room can probably um, testify that that getting to that first meal is usually the hardest. Um, what was what was kind of like your experience with that as far as? getting over that, that million dollar home. So like to get your acceleration going really. I identify now so far, say say probably four or five stages that were critical and where a lot of changes happening in our organization. 
the first was then I realized that I need to focus on you know processes I would say uh, or responsibility who's responsible for what communications then it got to the five million dollars <coughs> all right now policies heard my policies it got to 10 million dollars from there and that was challenging because there was a lot of things that had to do with legal you become like I say, you're now an elephant. You, people can see it. Twenty million dollars was another one. It doesn't mean that that's how everyone's going to go, every company. But that's how I experimented. That there was stages where, you know, oh, what we have in place will be will support, you know, uh, twenty million dollars or biggest challenge at that time was, you know, IRS insurance. EMR, you know, which I'm talking about, you know, things that would affect how you land a contract or not, uh, processes in place, communication, trainings, manuals, all of this good stuff. And then, you know, as we approach 50 million, then there was other challenges that have to do with employer retention. Um, I was sharing with a few here that for the last two years, we have one mission in at Ambassador, and it's employee experience and customer experience. Everything else we, in a way, develop, tweak it a little bit more, but you probably relate that there's an issue right now with the cost of labor, the shortness of labor, and we decided that the best thing that we can do was to focus on how or employee, not even our employee, but the applicant, the individual looking to apply, feels when they walk out into your office or go through the onboarding process. That's where the experience starts. The day that someone answered the phone, that your supervisor, you know, called them back whenever they, they need something. Do we provide the tools that are needed? Same situation with the customer. So, in my opinion, you become a broker between your customers and your employees. You gotta please both to them. Because if one of those leave, then <laughs> you you're in trouble no matter what. Okay, um and like what like what point in that journey when you were starting your your first one? Um, what point in that journey did you be like, oh crap, like, I need funding, I need to go borrow some money or financing or whatever it is? Always. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's an interesting question because, um, again, I, you know, the question is, a lot of times, or let me put it this way, a lot of times, those resources Fundings are already within your company. You just have to start looking inside your company to see where the money is going. Or what I call my director of finance, I say, when I hire him, I say, I want you to do one thing. Chase the money. Tell me where the money is. And we focus on that. And we do very well. Know where you're spending. Um, Mark was talking earlier. And I went to talk to Mark because we have the opportunity to work together with some of the individuals, big icons in the industry, very impressive people. And a lot of times those little items that you think they're personal, Jessica talked about this, you're, oh, I'm gonna pay for my meal, I'm gonna do this. You don't realize how much impact that has, not only in your cash flow, but also because it doesn't provide a good picture of your finances. You was like, oh, I'm not losing money. No, you're not losing money. The company isn't. The company might not be even losing money or breaking even. It's just that there's expenses that don't belong to the company. One key component of that is understand that you are not the brand. The company is a living entity that you are who is in charge of making it grow. So there's a lot of times that funding is there, um, talking to the bank, and I'll tell you one thing. As you start looking into your financials, 
and start separating those personal expenses or unnecessarily expenses. And sometimes it's the company like overbuying products, is having budgets, whatever it is. You present this to the bank, and a lot of financial institutions want to wants to do business with you. But if they see a financial statement full of, you know, trips to Bahamas, they they're not they understand this. They've seen thousands of uh, financial statements. They will say, "Wait a second, you're in business. You're probably going to take my quarter of a million dollars, my two hundred thousand dollars line of credit, and you spend in the Bahamas." It's all about perception. They don't know that that's how you, you're not looking at it from that perspective, but that's how the rest of them take it. Make sense? All right, question, question. What other questions do you have? I have two that I'm going to ask at the end, but I'm waiting. Oh, now we got like three. Okay. All right, well, from no questions to three questions, and I got, I was on a jog here. All right, go for it. Um, you said you're not a janitorial company, so with like insurance purposes, what would you classify your business, the N N I C S code, like a marketing or a connection business where you connect cleaners to clients? What would you classify it? Well, I was referring to how we boost opposition or labor force to not to not diminish itself to just cleaners. It doesn't mean that that's for more, right? That's for culture. It has nothing to do with reporting to the IRS or insurances. Um, now, currently, we have four big line of business. Five now, actually. Uh, janitorial, specialty services, which is window, floor. Uh, we do have landscaping, mechanical, and recently we jumped into security. So which ones we have? We have all these lines of business, different divisions, but it doesn't mean that I need to call cleaner my cleaner or, or porter. They're all technicians. And actually, it helps us. And that's only how we do business, right? That's, it helps us to have cost centers to understand the different levels and trainings, make things a lot easier. Because I can say all technicians go through this safety program. Versus saying the janitors, the porters, then the landscapers, you know, it's kind of narrowed down to be easier at this point in, in business. Well, for the sake of excelling it, like how you classify your business, would it matter? Like, let's say you're a, like an Angie's list, for example, if you connect cleaners to clients versus a cleaning company, they could be classified and valued differently at exit strategy. Do you still classify it legally as a cleaning service or generally? Legally? Legally, yes. I yes. have to. We have to. But as far as uh, marketing point, um, I'm not sh I, we don't do residential, by the way. Uh, I've been in the residential side of it. We're not doing it now. Um, I typically don't promote titles. I promote services. So I don't, I probably will say, you know, uh, residential cleaning services, May services, but not necessarily will say, oh, the best May in town. Uh, I probably, that's how I probably would do it. Well, that is, uh, Henry, you got, you got a, you have one here, one over there. Um, when you were going from your five to ten million or five to fifteen million, what were some of your biggest mistakes that you look back that you could have done different to maybe help you grow faster, or some things that were really a waste of time that you shouldn't have been focusing on? Right. Oops. Um, one of many. Yeah. Um, I would say focusing on growth. Top line versus bottom line was one. You wouldn't do that again? Depending on the strategy. But at that point, that was not the strategy. Uh, we just go, 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 sales. Um, we currently have uh, three sales reps. That's it. At one point, we have six, seven, and we were a much smaller company. And we were getting deals that had come. Any deal that was thrown at us, it was like, ah, yeah, good. Uh, we got more sophisticated, and I say sophisticated is we kind of learn our lesson. And I like to think of a, who is my perfect customer? 
right? Then I start, i tell you a story. There's a customer, we used to, true story, there was a customer at one point that represented $9 million of my business. Spread up throughout the nation, 2,800 retail store locations. It created so much chaos internally that the 80-20 rule, and Mark heard this before, he's, he's laughing back there, 20% of your customers bring 80% of your profits. The other 20 also bring 80% of your problems. That customer was on that. All my resources were utilized to place in this customer. Which took this customer thinking, oh, this is gonna be the best, you know, because it's the largest customer we ever land. It was wrong. I will not make that mistake anymore. Um, in fact, it was actually drawing the company because uh, they wouldn't pay on time. They utilized all my resources so my other customers start complaining. I'm like, I don't have the resources because this is a huge customer. Let's focus on the big one. Forget about the smaller ones, but guess what? Big ones come and go and hurt the company. The small ones keep you in business. So make sure you balance that scorecard because you don't want to have just the big ones. No, keep it balanced. Did I answer your question? <laughs> All right, I know we had one over here, back there. No. Yes, hi. Um, you mentioned before that you uh, welcome the new employees with a card when they receive the uniform. We sometimes, or a lot of times, we have already people waiting, already approved, ready to start. But we call them, the supervisor will come in overnight. So we don't have the time to, I mean, for the letter to get to me, sign it, send it to them. Like, how do you handle that? Like, to emergencies. I'm sure you had emergencies. Like, you had a feeling for someone. How do you handle that? Uh, part of that success, the gentleman over there, <laughs> he kept me on track. Uh, but, you know, truly is now time. I mean, now I don't devote. The company now has so many who say the management is pretty large. Um, my participation is on you know those quarterly you know I would say uh, business review internally, financial meetings monthly. I receive the report, I look at it, say thumbs up, one, two, three, uh, you know action items. Uh, so it, what is not me, someone in the company have to do it. My point is, as you get bigger, right? I mean, let's think about, I mean, what if you get to the 5,000 employees? You turn over, you're probably hiring 200 people per month. Do you have the time? If you don't, let's make sure there's someone in your organization. No, I was surprised that you, with 1,300 employees, were able to do it, because I didn't, it, 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 but it's amazing that you do it. I think it's great. But yeah, and I do it. Uh, you know, uh, on a Saturday, uh, let's say, uh, <laughs> they would be on my desk and I just, you know, this is a man, take a beer on a Saturday. <laughs> I mean, it's not on the day, at least. Um, no, 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 it's not on the day. Okay. No, uh, if someone can do it and bring rent, that's great. But um, if you, if you have the opportunity to do it, individuals will know. I mean, when they receive something and say, hey, it's coming from the CEO and here is their values and you're telling them, welcome to the team. We are a winning team. You have no idea. They ne Nobody have done it. You know, people, uh, recently we were in a gala and we have the opportunity to invite a porter with us and, and with, her, with her daughter and say, she like, no, I don't even know how to dress for the, you know, the impact that she, ha, she have on everyone else working. There's, in that particular account, there's like, uh, I think like 70 people working and uh, I don't know. She went and told everyone, oh my God, I'm going to this game. And we, we probably took it and she sat with us on, on, on the table. Huge impact. So, you know, we impacted 
70 individuals in our organization. So those, I'm just saying small things make a huge impact in your, in your business. All right. I know we're running um, into time here, so we have about 10, 15 more minutes, so make sure you get your question in, and then you have a question, and then can you raise your hand if you have another question, just so that I know where to go next? Yeah. Come on over here. Cool. Um, what are some of the daily KPIs that you and your team track? All right, there's, depending on the department, there's everyone have, and we constantly modifying and developing news, new new KPIs. Um, I like to look at more from KPAs, the activities, because a lot of it, our experience was we were telling them, okay, this is how we're gonna metric your performance. I'm ready to say this is the things I expect you to do on a daily basis as a minimum. Um, and then it's a numbers game. Sales, operations, everything is numbers game. I mean, how many, for instance, on a daily basis, how many OBOs, over budget offenders, uh, we have, <laughs> Mark? Sorry. Uh, OBOs, we have, uh, you know, oh, we need to reduce this by 10% tomorrow. Let's do it. How do we do that? Well, we already have, let's, see reduce everyone by 15 minutes things of that nature there's so many different aspects to the kpis are you providing the tools for them to succeed all right uh, that is even they're even even from the clocking system that you use right um, are you providing them with um, with a good vacuum cleaner or you need to align those KPIs with the tools that you're providing and the training. Uh, you can't just tell them, hey, I'm gonna judge you if you don't complete X, Y, C task. I, I want you to vacuum all this. Okay, well, you give me a vacuum that actually break in the middle, <laughs> the floor. Oh, well, you didn't vacuum. You gotta be, it gotta be in line, expectations with tools, you know, and and the capabilities of the person you hire. Hi, and first of all, before we start, I just want to let you know I admire you, man, and I want to be like you when I grow up. <laughs> so, I don't know about that. <laughs> yeah, so I just, you know, we were talking earlier about they do um, own that um, um, residential cleaning, so I just wanted to ask, if you can share with us your insight on how do you su successfully transition from residential cleaning to commercial? It was a tough one. <laughs> um, the biggest thing in that transition was to understand that this is experience. I'm, I'm not saying that this is the case on everyone, but this is how it went to us. We identified that we were trying to sell to commercial the same way we were selling to residential. And that was my first company, by the way. The first, not the second one. The second one is the one with the culture. The first one was in the residential uh, market. We were going to commercial. I remember we were trying to tackle movie theaters. I always I just wants to do movie theater. We're one of the toughest cleanings. And in my flyers to residential, we were telling the, the buyer, oh, we are here, we're gonna make sure our uh, mates are you know, uniform, and we're gonna make sure that whenever you need us, you call us and please clean. Well, nobody was calling us back from the commercial because Residential buyers are emotional buyers. Commercial buyers are logical buyers. Think about this. Your residential buyer is the individual who owns the house, owns everything within that property, right? The house, they're letting you in. And most of the time, the owner is there. That individual get emotional about, 
I feel good with you. I connect with you, and I like you. On the commercial side, the individual, the 90% of the time, who's going to hire you and sign the contract, is not the owner of the building. So think about that individual responsibility by giving you that key. He's more concerned about processes, security, safety, how you will implement, why would you give you that contract that his owner would not call him on the middle of the night. So once we understood that, it went like a switch. We changed the way we approached that customer, the commercial customer, and then we start seeing results. We're like, hey, our cleaners are trained to actually check every door in the building to make sure that the building is secure. Oh, great. Hey, our cleaners send a report on a daily basis of all the tasks has been completed. Great. On the residential side, the working mom, you know, whoever is hiring, will come in and inspect themselves. They don't even, you might have a little checklist, but it's a one-way connection. A commercial and I think that was the biggest thing that we learned from my first company to the second one. All right, it sparked, it sparked an interest in me when you were talking KPI. So I, I know you've got a lot of different divisions, different things going on. So more at your level today. So you got KRAs, KPIs. My question is when you are managing these, how focused are you on the leading indicators for those KPIs versus the, the lagging indicators? Do you have a preference and focus when you're looking at this? One leads to the other. One's outcome and one's going to tell you what the outcome is going to be. I'm, I'm just curious what your philosophy is on leading lagging indicators for the KPIs. I love that question, by the way. I may have so many years of experience. <laughs> I focus on what is working. Because a lot of the times, it would never be perfect. We focus on what's broken, that we take or focus away of what is working. Numbers game. Do more of what works and less of what doesn't work. So if something is working, do more of that and less of the other. So to answer your question, I focus on what is working versus what's not. And that comes secondary. Which one needs the most attention? If you need to look at the leading, you look at that. If the lagging's working, you know the leading's working. Excellent. That's correct. That's the answer. That is correct. All right. So I have a question. I think I know we're up into time, so I have a few questions, but um, I'll start with this one. So, I mean, can you guys all tell that he has a lot of experience in the space? Yeah, right? There's no way it doesn't. Um, tell us a little bit about what's next. What's the next vision? Um, obviously, James and I know, um, but we also know that for someone that has grown su such a successful uh, professional maintenance company, right, um, now you're moving into the ERP, right, software. So would you mind telling people a little bit about why, if I was, I mean, if I had that big company, why am I making such a switch to build something from, from the ground up? So we would love to understand a little bit about that and what's next for you. Yeah, um, so, I'm also the founder, as James mentioned, of uh, U-Source Technology. I'm not a, a software engineer by any means. What, in the last four years, I kind of, but has become one by learning, you know, from them. It's a completely different world. Through the years, I was looking for something that actually would help me to manage my business in one platform. Because as we were growing, we were needing more controls. So what I did, I just, oh, I'm going to sign up for this service, someone to manage my time in attendance. Oh, I was using QuickBooks here. Oh, we're using something for CRM with uh, Salesforce. Oh, we did. And I realized that I was spending so much money, not in the platforms, but to consolidate all this information and the metrics were not there. I can't see them. Because right? this one's telling me one thing. This one is I have to connect to all my cost of just putting that together was extremely high. So we decided to invest in something that actually will help us and help others like us up there. 
one platform, you know, that allow you to scale from one employee to as many as you want, because that was another problem. There's many platforms out there that will sell me blocks of employees. Hey, I'm gonna sell you this for 10 users, 15 users, but what happened if out of the 10, I only have three? What happened if out of the 50, now, you know, I only have, you know, 26, oh, the bracket is 25. It's too costly. As you scale up, it will cost you a fortune. So we thought, well, you know what? We're going to make <coughs> something, make sure the ones, the system, the platform will improve your communications. We provide visibility, live visibility, of what's happening with your organization. Uh, and three, it will reduce your operational cost. And if it didn't do two of those, no function in, in our platform was implemented. It was a discussion we have and we always go, it does this, yes, it does, no. So don't implement. Um, I think it has been of a tremendous help for ambassador services because I can see when someone is approaching over time. Because if you don't have that problem now, where are you going, you probably will. We have problems with individuals forgetting to clock out. Do they, any one of you have a problem with people forgetting to clock out or not reporting the right number of hours? Did anyone? Because we have. <coughs> the system have an amazing, and, and we are the only one. We have a patent on that functionality that actually auto clocked out your employees if they leave and forget to clock out, provide you, you know, and, and everything within legal boundaries, because someone asked me this, we're not geo-tracking. It's, it's something that we have a pattern on it. Um, supply control and budgets. It's something I never couldn't figure out more than Excel sheets. I mean, you see, every one of you ever, you start looking at it, grab the information from QuickBooks and, okay, cost centers and all. At least in here, one click will provide you budget versus actual, not only on schedule, but the financial, uh, uh, the money that was allocated. Eventually, as we were growing, my managers were showing, oh, <coughs> negative numbers on, on, on labor. I mean, they're, they're like, you know, we saving a thousand dollars out of the budget but the number of hours that they have exceeded in numbers. So that's telling me that, you know, one, they're only compensated, but they're not being affected in the execution. Same situation, the opposite. If they were losing money, but saving tons of hours, then tells me that the way or the wages that we pay is more than they budgeted, but they have find ways to be more efficient. Once we implement the use source, it was an eye open. It's like one click and currently we operate, Ambassador operates out of that platform uh, from the sale all the way to HR, uh, time and attendance, uh, uh, supply chain, buy you supplies, save us. Actually, in the first year we were able to save $600,000 between labor and supplies. Go figure that. It was amazing. 